All right, you got your Bible. Everybody have an outline. We're doing the outline that was two weeks ago. The outline that was two weeks ago, it's titled uh, New and Living Way, Part 1. And if you got your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18. We're just going to um, get through the outline here and uh, go through it real quick because I've got some other things I want to say. But the text that we're looking at is 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching or proclamation of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. And I ask the question, who experiences the power? Not those listening, but those who are preaching it. And the key to this is when you're proclaiming the cross, you don't proclaim this is what he did. That's where 99% of Christians, that's what they'll do. Well, Jesus died on the cross and he, he can heal you and he can deliver you. And, you know, if you're talking to somebody, I mean, really, that's what we're called to do. In fact, if you look at your outline um, on the other page, you'll see Matthew 28. That's the number three. We are to take what Christ did in us and multiply it in the lives of other people by proclaiming, by sharing the cross. Not telling people what he did, but telling them what you are as a result of what he did. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Crazy example, but it's true. I've gone to different gyms throughout my life and worked out, and there's always... Rarely do they have a trainer that's, that you would look at and go, I want to be like that. What did you do to get those results? Everybody that has a trainer, I look at and go, you, did you even spend any time in the gym? <laughs> How many have seen that? Yeah. I mean, it's like that's, I, I, I don't know if I can trust you. Or someone who says to you, oh, I'll get a good diet for you. We're always all, everybody's dieting. And so they're telling you about this diet they've been on for like a year and giving you the graphs and the percentages and the sugars and the carbs and the proteins and the fats. And you're looking at them like, it's not working on you. <laughs> right? I mean, you've been on this thing a year and you know, I was, well, I've only lost a couple of pounds. But, it, but it, scientifically, it's, I, want, I want to talk to somebody that, it, that it's working on. So if all you're going to do is tell somebody, and this is where it separates, it's just, this gets, you can't just be a mere Christian anymore once you understand the cross. You, you, when you're talking to somebody, you've got to say, look, this is what he did, but I am a result of what he did. And then you begin to proclaim to the person who you are as a result of what he did. Otherwise, you're that, that fat person trying to tell another fat person how to go on a diet. Or a skinny person telling another skinny person how to gain weight, right? Sometimes they can't do that. Yeah, well, the fact is, there's got to be results. And Christianity is at a place where we don't see manifestation. We don't see results. We do more talking than we do showing. Does that make sense? Um, so, let me ask you a question. So, okay, do you understand what I mean by you have to proclaim the cross, not what he did, but who you are as a, you can tell what he did, but you are a result of what he did. I, and this is where you get into the I am's. I am. And you know what, you don't have to be perfect, but there's got to be some manifestation or experience that you have. You don't want to be talking to someone who has zero experience in what they're talking about. You're going to go to a doctor who's, who, who, um, you got a, you got a heart problem, and you say to him, to the doctor, you know, have you done this before? Oh, no, 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 no. I've done this before. You, you, you've, not, you, you've not did surgery? The surgery you want to do on me, you've never done? No, I've, this, you're my first one. You, you're going to have anybody that's known this 
surgery, done it a bunch of times, going to be there like assisting you? Ah, oh, I got it. <laughs> you want somebody with experience, or say, you take, hey, I can fix your car. Well, what credentials do you have? I, I, I just, you know, I jack of all trades, but they don't know what they're doing. You want somebody who can do what they say they can do. If I'm preaching the gospel to somebody, I have to be the experience of that gospel. Otherwise, we're just talking about God and the Bible. And there's no power in that. The power is in proclaiming you as a result of the cross. The I am. That make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I hope so because that's where the power is. Now, it's not just that either. It goes to you personally. I think it's Psalms 43. I think we talked about this. I don't know what I talk about to who anymore, so repeats are good anyway. <laughs> Psalm 43, David said, Soul, he's talking to himself, why are you depressed? Why are you discouraged? Why are you downcast? Get up, hope in God. And he began to, he was speaking to himself, out loud to himself. Now, is he nuts? David said that he encouraged himself in the Lord. When everybody was against him, no family member, no friend, it was the, the thing that happened at Ziklag, and they were all getting ready to stone him, and the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. No one else was going to encourage him. So he had to talk to himself. So you have to not only articulate the cross to other people, you have to articulate it to yourself. So in other words, when the devil comes to you with those passions and desires that Galatians 5.24 says you've been crucified, they've been crucified, he wants to resurrect them, you say to him, I am crucified. You speak that. You declare that. And you've got to do it with boldness, meaning this. If you don't have a revelation of it and a faith in it, your words will just fall to the ground. They won't be weighty. And so you have to have a conviction of who you are in Christ and what he does in you and who he says you are and it's not something you have to become that's the thing about the I am's you're not waiting to become what he says you are if you have his spirit and life in you you are already that by him by being in him so you have every legal right to say I am delivered <clears throat> though the flesh still may be in bondage to something I am not that I am this. I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here before God, when you start speaking to yourself who you are, the I am's, there is a power that comes on you, and I'm telling you from experience, it works. Amen. I'm not lying because I'll, you know, I've, I've gone the way the traditional church, and I can't change. I can't get nothing going. I keep trying. I keep failing. I keep trying until the revelation of the cross came back, we had this revelation in the 80s um, through the book Watch Many of the Normal Christian Life and the Spiritual Man. Great two books to continue reading on this if uh, you, you, know, you want to still keep renewing your mind on this. But it wasn't around until 2013 that it really began to just take a hold again in a more deeper way. And um, it's line upon line, folks. This is not something you're going to get. So if you walk out of here and you don't get it right away, this is what we talked about Sunday morning, by the way. If you don't get it right away, that's okay. Just keep studying it. Keep presenting yourself. Keep speaking over your life what the Word says happened to you by way of the cross. <clears throat> and it will, once it takes grip, you'll be in an acceleration mode. What you have been trying to get over for years, you will get over in weeks. Once, it, once you get some um, tread on this topic, the revelation of it. Okay? So, the power of the cross. Now, I want to ask a few questions. And I'm, I've got some statements here I'm going to read off of. How many believe that there is something in you that needs to be fixed or removed by God before He can do something in you? What? How many people believe that there is something in you, that there might be something in you, that needs to be fixed or removed before God can get something to you or in you? In other words, um, God wants to do this great thing in you, but you've got to stop this or do this in order for that thing to happen in your life. This is where, you, this is where most people hear this. No. That's a trick question. No, the answer is no. Well, of course it's no for you guys. I mean, everybody knows by now I, I do trick questions. <laughs> um, so, no, let me ask you another. How many believe that there is something wrong with you that requires an act of God to get it out of you before he can get something to you or through you? 
I mean, this is our conversation. When I just got to really, you know, I, I know I'm trusting God for this, but I'm just asking whatever he's got to do in me to get this thing going, something he's got to do in me. What I'm saying, the, these two questions, what I'm asking is this. Do you feel that you are so incomplete that he has to do something in you in order for something to happen to you? But that's where all Christians are. Every message out there tells you that. This is why they have you on this treadmill of performance. Do, do this, don't do that. Because if you do this, then you know God will do that. And if you fast, you can break that thing. If you pray, you can get that thing. It's like you're, there's always something you have to do in order for God to do something in you. What we've got to get to this place is that there is absolutely nothing God's trying to do to you. Ah, but I got a temper. Okay, he ain't, he ain't working on it. I lust after women. I got a porn pro. He ain't working on it. You, you, you see, you're taking things. Oh, God, help me with this lying. God, help me with this gossiping. So again, what you're saying is you think God has, God needs to do a work on you. Now, how many of, how many believe that? That. You know, God's working on my patience. God's working on my temper. God's working on this. God's working on that. What work is he doing? What just does anybody want to play around with me here? Nobody's going to be wrong. Just what have you typically learned? What work are you asking him to do? What are you waiting for him to do? Deliver you. Deliver you. If you got an addiction of some sort, what? Make me perfect so I can do. What he wants to do. Yeah, yeah, make me perfect. That's about it, yeah. But you're at, you're always, you know, we're always, the church has us in this mode that God's working on us. God's trying to change something. Trying, God's trying to get something in me. So he, before he can do that, he got to take something out of me. He can't bless me in this area. I got a bad temper. Till I get rid of this temper, I can't move in this area. Yeah. So I'm waiting for him to work on that area. Now that's all bogus. And that is the 98% of pastors preach this. I promise you that. Because what did I tell you in Galatians 1? They perverted the gospel. They put the front and the back and the back and the front. I'm not telling you. This is Bible. I'm not telling you anything that's not true. We went through the Galatians chapter 1 on perverting the gospel. So what, so what I'm trying to get you to see is because you still can't get to this place of 1 Corinthians 1.18. I can say that, but you won't do it. Because you have been brainwashed with God's got to do. So you will not be able to say something to somebody because you don't think God's worked on that part of your life yet. So your imperfections or whatever, your flesh, keeps you from articulating the very thing that brings the power of God in you. Wouldn't that be a nice trick of the devil? If he knew that this was true and the power would come if you would just speak what Christ did in your life concerning the cross but get you to feel like he hasn't done that work and God still needs to do work on you so you're not going to confess it. Here's what you'll confess, your temper. Real easy to confess that. Mm -hmm. It's easy to confess our sins. It's easy to confess our weaknesses. But it is hard to say something your flesh and your mind can't line up with. Can you imagine an alcoholic saying, I am not an alcoholic. He can't get himself to say it. In fact, they tell him he has to say that before he can take the first step. Right? Right. So again, what is it? See, when we believe that there's more that God has to do. Now listen, I'm going to take my time with this. When we believe that there's more that God has to do that he already hasn't done, that's not finished yet, we will see the cross as a work in progress. Now, so is the cross a work in progress, or did he say it was finished? Did he say, wait till the next age for part two? No. I'll do half of it now, but when I come back and split the eastern sky, I'll do part two. Is it a finished work? Yes. What is it you're waiting for God to do? What is it you're waiting for God to work on if he already finished it? So then what do we do with our issues? 
What do we do with this stuff? How do we, how do we navigate? I don't, I don't, I, I'm so used to confessing my flesh. That's all we do is confess. Nobody confesses their spirit. We confess the flesh. And that's crucified. Why are we confessing the very thing he crucified and the very life he gave us we won't acknowledge? We won't speak. Remember the tea and the water? We've got to now start speaking from the tea, not the water. I've been speaking from the water all my life till I got saved. Now I've got to speak as if I'm tea. I don't speak no more from the basis of water. Should have brought the two, yeah. to two drawers. You, right? right? You have to now speak from spirit. You have to speak from new creation. You have to speak from the new man. Not from that which was crucified and ended. Well, but you don't understand. I still... Yeah, I know you still have problems. But the answer is not lining up with your problems and confessing your problems. When they've been crucified. The only thing you want to say about your problems... They were crucified. That's the only <clears throat> voice you speak to your flesh. You're crucified. I'm not a debtor to you. What Christ did was a finished work. You're done. I'm done. You bow to what I say. Like David was saying in the Old Covenant. So, wake up. You're not going to sit here and be depressed. Do you realize you have that power? You don't to pop a couple of pills to go over depression. You wake up and you speak to that flesh and say, Depression, you ended 2,000 years ago. You bow. That's, you're not de your spirit is not depressed. And that's who you are. Old things pass away. That's discouragement, depression. Every evil thing. God doesn't put anything that you feel God's not blessing you with. And it's a curse of the law or a work of the enemy. It has to bow to you. I remember one day waking up thinking, Why am I bowing down to these things? They bow to me. And I'm telling you, as God, my, something went off that day I saw that. And it wasn't that I got the victory. I got the victory 2,000 years ago. I just realized it. I've been the victor all this time over depression or whatever your thing is. I've been the victor all this time, and I've been bowing down to this thing. Didn't have to. So we have to believe that it's a finished work and that by the cross he has perfected us, made us complete, and there's no extra work he's got to do on us. The work that has to be done is your eyes opening to the new man, to your new identity. Okay? Now, it's not on your um, outline, but go to write it down under number two. We already did number one. Truth brings freedom. We're not going to go through that again. Number two. Application of God's truth brings manifestation. Now that application is what I'm saying to you. You've got to apply it with, what, with, your, with your heart. Man believeth. And with the mouth confession is made. That's how you got saved. And that's how you continue your salvation. Is through speaking. Go to James 1.22. James 1.22. This, this, this verse is totally misquoted completely. This verse can be used very legalistically, but not tonight. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, He's like a man, he's likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightforward forgive what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, you gotta, you got to see the picture here that James is painting is that if a guy looks into a mirror I mean no would it not freak you out if you looked into a mirror and saw another image beyond yourself like a horror movie you've seen the girl looks into the mirror and it's some old hag and she screams okay every time you look in the mirror you see yourself 
Right? You, there, I, there I am. Yep. You know? Yep. All right. You go off. Now, if you don't... James says that if you see... If you see the word, you hear the word, and you don't do it, you're like the guy who looked in the mirror and walked away and went, wait a minute, who am I? i got to go back. Oh, okay, I know who I am. Everybody knows who they are, and you remember what you look like. But James says if you hear the word and don't do it, you're like the guy who looks in the mirror, walks away, and forgets what he saw. Where people miss on this scripture is this is about identity. This is about identity. This is a guy looking into the mirror of the word. See, the word is who the word, I am what the word says I am. So when I go to the word, I see my identity in that word in Christ Jesus. Now, if I walk away and I get having coffee with someone and tell them how a terrible person I am and I need this and I need that and all the woes of how bad I am, I'm the guy who looked into the Word, saw the I am's, walked away, said the opposite of what the Bible says. Right? Yes. So James says, if any man be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, so my doing is out of identity. That's huge. That's gigantic huge. You can look at doing as legalistic. It's the law, do it. Work the word and the word works. Right? Or, out of my identity, I am, so I do. Because I am. Not because I have to, but I am. So, when I, and this is why you have to renew your mind. This is huge. Every day you have to renew your mind who you are because the flesh has not been born again. God crucified this. God crucified this. Do you understand what that means? He put this on the electric chair. So it ended. It ended. We don't talk about it no more. This is why Paul said, We know no man after the flesh. If you're sitting here today and you got an alcoholic problem, I am not knowing you after your alcohol. Because he ended that 2,000 years ago. When I'm going to speak to you as the new man because that's your deliverance. 2,000 years ago. You've got to have your eyes open. That's not who you are. If we've got to scream it from the housetops, that flesh has been crucified. You are living a lie. It's deceit. Just like Satan deceived Eve. You have been deceived into thinking you're something he crucified 2,000 years ago. This is, not, this is not a battle for you to fight. It's an eye-opener. All this is supposed to be is an eye-opener. You don't do anything. He did it all. You just have to have your eyes open to it. And then when you start articulating, I am not that, your deliverance is on its way. You will, you, oh, not that it's on its way. I hate that. But you're obviously not getting it yet, right, if you still have the problems. So it's like, okay, i got to go back here and go back to that mirror and find out what that word says because I don't want to walk away and forget who I am. I am what the word says I am. And I will be a doer of what I hear him say I am out of my new identity. Okay? So it brings manifestation. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, is that one on your, on your outline? Yes. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect. And the knowledge and the acknowledging, underline that. And the acknowledging of what? This stuff's not going to happen by osmosis. I know Christians, me included, fought over things with the Lord and the Satan and everything for years over situations, circumstances, or sins, or habits, or addictions, or whatever you want to call them, and. We don't acknowledge the truth. We are acknowledging the problem. We read it again. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through what? Preaching. So you acknowledge the truth, and he manifests his word through what? Preaching. Preaching. So I acknowledge it, I speak it, and he manifests it. That make sense? Yes. So you, can, you, you don't... 
You cannot talk about the flesh anymore. You know, I've been a, I've been a pastor, I've, I've been saved 40 years and probably in the ministry for 30, 35. It's debatable. Um, I mean, because, well, you don't want to minister until you did this. Well, no, whatever. I started speaking 35 years ago, so I would assume that I was in the ministry for 35 years. Did you go to college? Yeah, well, yes. And um, so here we go. I, I've, I've pastored all kinds of people. And nine times out of ten, they want to tell me about their life according to the flesh. How many times they've been married? How many times they've been divorced? How many, you know, what, what, you know, I've lost my son. I've done, and they give you all the woes, and it's like, what? You obviously think that has a bearing on your present, because if you do, it is definitely going to affect your future, because that has been, it's old, passed away. All things become new. Your past is irrelevant. To yesterday, <clears throat> folks, is irrelevant. Do you understand that? Even if it was a victory you got. I had a victory a couple days ago. I, I would uh, uh, say it was a cool thing. But it's like, okay, next. I'm not, it, it's, it's like, okay, I, I appreciate that. You know that I do. But I ain't, I ain't camping out there because now it's old. I have to now forget what lies behind and keep pressing forward to what lies ahead. Because even your successes can hold you back if you camp out at them. And that's why God would not allow the children of Israel to stay at one place too long in the wilderness. That cloud had to keep moving. Had to keep moving. If you stay at a past success too long, what happened if they stayed? What happened if Israel stayed at, in the wilderness in a particular place too long? You got six million people. How much waste can you produce and not move on? Huh? They had to move on because if they stayed there too long, they didn't have a sewage system. I mean, they did a lot of dumping. Right? One and two, all over the place. Time to move on. And your successes, you've got to move on. You can't, I, you can't go, well, back in the day, I did this. and that. Okay, but what's he doing today? Today are you hearing his voice? <clears throat> that make sense? Yeah. So um, Titus says you have to acknowledge what he did, which is the truth. You have to preach that truth, and God will manifest his word through us. So, 2 Timothy 8, 1, you, you can look that up. It says, do it. Act and speak in life as Jesus' death ended life. So we act and speak in life. Everything you act on, everything you speak is in accordance with Jesus' death ending your life. As man knows it, as you know it, and raised you to life as God fathered it. So, here's something else pastoring I've found out. You get a guy or a woman that comes to your church, and when you're a small church, this really gets apparent. It really stands out like a sore thumb. And they get in with everybody, and they want to broadcast their past. They want to broadcast their past sins. They may get on Facebook and broadcast their past sins. And they go on and on and on how they used to be. Um, your flesh has been crucified and for us to keep talking about the old man or the old ways or even the inclinations and passion desires of the flesh should not ever be entertained among us as Christians. You say, you know what? I don't want to hear that. That's your flesh. It's crucified. Why are we talking about that? God may want to, and you get pastors to do this and preachers on TV. They like every now and then talk about how bad they were. Oh, I was a bad guy in my day. Man, if you would have honked my horn. What's that? Just read it. If you would have been behind me and honked the horn, I would have came out and busted you in the nose. Well, why, would I, why do I need to hear that? Huh? That's, that, that was, that's your old man. That's, that's. That's your, even if you're still saved, um, hey, that's your flesh. Why are we talking about something that the Lord ended 2,000 years ago? See, the only tell you why we're still carnal and still in our sins is because we keep talking about them as if they are us. 
and they're not us anymore. I died. Galatians 2.20 is your scripture tonight and the rest of your life. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's your scripture for the rest of your life. So if you're, look, this is going to offend people. I, I understand. And as a pastor, I will probably keep offending people because Paul says, no, no man after the flesh. So that means if I've got somebody coming to my church and all they want to talk about is their flesh and their past and their weaknesses and their sins, and then they want to know what my sins are. You know, I know you're not perfect. What are you battling? Why are we talking on that level? There are people that, I mean, there are countless that I've come across that, that's, you know why? That's their identity! They have talked about that damn sin for so long, it's their life. And the Bible says you have been crucified with that passion, with that desire. Why are you talking about it? And we Christians let them talk about it. And we just keep sealing that sin in their lives. Say, dude, that isn't that is you no more. I, I don't know why you want to keep going there and just keep pushing crucifixion. Crucifixion. You're dead. And if they don't want to talk, and if you make them mad, that's good. Make them mad. You, don't, you cannot talk about something he ended. It's, you're dead. And I told Stevie this. I, I, I know how people think. 40 years, I know how people think. Um, God gave me an illustration because I know what someone's going to say. You're taking this death thing too far. You know, come on, I know what he, but you're just taking it too far. You're getting too serious. You're too um, zealous about it. And I know people are going to think that. Because there's a lot of preachers who don't want to talk about the cross. They think, well, that's how you guys, we don't talk about that no more. What? You're just taking that death thing too far, okay? So the, God gave me this illustration. As soon as I heard that, in my spirit, the illustration came. So let's, tell, let's take this woman. I don't know, 70-year-old. 70-year-old woman. Her husband dies. She's been with him for 45, 50 years. She's devastated. She goes to the funeral home, right? And she picks out a casket and a suit, and they embalm him and all that, stick him in the casket, and she's got all the funeral arrangements, everything set, and the first showing is usually family, right? So she comes in there with her kids and whoever else, and they have that first private showing before it's open to the public, right? So she's sitting there, and finally they're like, well, it's getting time for the public to come in. She says, can you give me five more minutes by myself? <clears throat> and of course, they give her five minutes. Absolutely. Maybe she wants to say some last words or something or just have that time before everybody starts coming in there, right? Now, this is what God says. She'll, what, when people say to me, you're taking this death thing too far, this is what she's going to do in that five-minute period alone with her husband. All right, get up. I have, I have gone this far. I let you die. I got you the casket. I got you the suit. Now you're taking it way too far. Like it's a joke. Like it's a, a prank. Right? You're taking it too far. Get up. Now I've gone this far with you, but I'm not going any... I'm not putting you in that grave. You've taken death too far. My question is, how, do you, how, how far do you take death? You've got to take it all the way. Death means death. So you can't never talk enough about the cross. It is what it is all day long. Death is death. Amen. Amen. You can't go, okay, Greg, you know, I heard the death thing. I got it. No, you don't. You will hear this death thing because Galatians 2.20 is your scripture the rest of your life. It is something you've got to keep renewing your mind on. And we haven't even gotten to the resurrection yet. Why would I have to keep remembering my death? Man, you don't understand the deliverance you have by that death. Do you realize that in that death that you're dead to any bad influence that comes to you? You are dead to anything people do to you? This is not just sin. This is the world because Paul says, I'm also crucified to the world in Galatians chapter 6. So when I, if I really embrace my death and realizing in my humanity, that simply means that when it comes to my flesh and humanity, now that I'm raised to new life, nothing that anybody can do can get to me because I'm dead. You're, if somebody's trying to push your buttons, 
Where are your buttons at? In your spirit or your flesh? Dead to buttons. What's that? I'm dead to buttons. Yeah. The buttons are where the flesh is that you're dead to. So when you, when you understand this, someone can yell at you and not be moved. Now, I, I'm, I'm being challenged right, this, right now with my, with, well, he's not, he's not a teenager anymore, he's 20. I'm being challenged with this because we can get into some heated battles. And just the other day, I'm like, I'm dead. You know what? What I want to do is my flesh. My spirit, man, is alive and doesn't respond in, in, in like manner. That's not who I am. See, I'm doing out of identity now. I'll tell you something else that happened just recently. I was, you know, God had some things he spoke to me <clears> he's going to do and waiting for God to do it. And I had this fear come over me like I'm inadequate. There's, 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 there's no way that I can do this. Which you're, it's too much. It's too entailed. I don't know if I can. And all of a sudden, my new man came up and said, my, my sufficiency is of him. Because Paul tells us that. My sufficiency is of him. And I'm telling you, the minute I said, oh, no. I never entertained the fear, because I used to fear over things. F things that are bigger than me. Sometimes in my past, I would sabotage something purposely so I wouldn't have to do it, because it's too big for me. Yeah. Even if it's a success, I don't want it. I, I, it would be too much on me, and I, I don't have faith in me. I'll blow it. So it kills the sabotaging, because a lot of people sabotage relationships. It goes too far, and like, no, nope, I'm not going any further, because I'm going to end up killing this thing anyway. Let's get out of it now. So that, when I said, when, when the Spirit rose up and said, no, 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 you're, you're equipped for every good work because that's who you are now. That's who He created you to be. What He's purposed you for, He created you for. And you will succeed in everything you lay your hand to that He's called you to. And move, boom, just like that. And this was just like three or four days ago. I realized, no, I'm not having that argument of fear. I'm dead. Fear bows. I'm not bowing to you talking to me like that anymore. You bow. You want, you want to know death? Death, if you're in an abusive relationship, a, a marriage where your husband beats you, or, in a or a relationship or a dating where the boyfriend beats you, and after so much torture and abuse, that woman now begins to think it's her fault. Then she starts and she's afraid to say anything. She's afraid to do anything. He has completely manipulated her. Right? You've seen situations like that? Are you all in the real world, or do you all live in a bubble? Or do you don't have no friends? There's a lot of women out there abused that are afraid to lift a finger because under that type of abuse for so long, they're in bondage to that guy and his ways. Okay? So, once you understand, in a heated battle, now here comes his, his um, intimidation. Here comes his fear tactics. And you can say, you know what? It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. I'm dead to those tactics. Yeah, but he'll hit me. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, he won't. I'm, I really believe. I'm not saying 100%, but I'm saying a lot of times, if you, would say, if you would understand that you're not dealing with your husband, you're dealing with the spirit behind that husband. And therefore, I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 says, I wrestle against principalities and powers. I'm, see, when you bow to that guy, that type of person, you're bowing to that spirit. Once you understand who you are, that spirit bows to you. You start speaking to that spirit that's on that person, and you stand up in faith in, in your new man, and every spirit, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a boss, or a neighbor, or anybody that intimidates you, it's a spirit trying to intimidate you. And if you, you back down, you're bowing. You're dead to intimidation. You're dead to coercion. You're dead to manipulation. I mean, these are the tactics people use on you. Wherever you go, there's people always using intimidation, <clears throat> coercion, domination. You're dead to that. Oh, I can't say no to people. There's another one. That's a spirit you're dealing with. And you, you bow to somebody else's will when you know you don't want to do it and it's not what God wants you to do. So you bow. No, you're dead. Well, they'll get mad. I'm dead to them. You're, what? The flesh is dead to them getting angry at me. But if your flesh is alive, then you don't want them to be mad at you. Did Jesus care who got mad at him? No. Oh, 
Peter says, Jesus, you offended the Pharisees when you said that. The other day when you said that, to, he said, you offended them. He said, whom my heavenly father did not plant, he will uproot. I don't care. Herod said, that you tell that fox this, that, and the other. He made the two people that supported his ministry, gave to him financially, and gave him a house to sleep in, Mary and Martha. He offended them when he didn't show up in time to save Lazarus. Mary wouldn't even come out of the house. She was offended. Now, you know, some people, oh, no, she was in there worshiping. She's always trying to make superheroes out of these Bible characters. They've got flesh and blood, man. She was offended. Okay? She wasn't in there worshiping. The one who should have stayed in there was Martha. She's the one connected to the kitchen. Mary was the one at his feet. She should have been out. I mean, what? I'm, Jesus is out there. Oh, I'll worship him from in the house. Really? <laughs> if you really want to worship, go out there and get at his feet like you did the other day. She wasn't worshiping. She was offended. And then comes out and says, Lord, if you would have been here, blah, blah, blah. You know the story. He wasn't afraid he wasn't going to bow to the personalities of people. He wasn't going to bow to their... Why? He was dead to it. Like you and I need to be dead to it. He was really dead to it. But now we are too after the cross. We're as dead to that as he was before the cross. I'm dead to how you want to think about me. How many people worried about... Well, I don't want, any, I don't want them to hate me. I, you worry about what other people think about you. That ended... That's part of your humanity. That ended. There is so much liberation when you understand you're dead. Nobody can move you. Somebody leaves your church, another, okay, sorry, but it's not going to change anything. I'm dead to your antics. It doesn't move me. That's why Paul said, none of these things move me. He knew his death. He applied his death to every part of his humanity. I'm only about what God's doing in my spirit and what he's raised me to. Everything else I'm dead to. This is why he said, know no man after the flesh. Because if we start knowing each other after the flesh, we, here's, here's a big one. So easy to get offended, isn't it? Sensitivities run high these days. And everybody gets offended over everything. Christians shouldn't. They're dead. They're dead. Now you understand why you have to understand anything about your humanity he ended and cannot have... Because if God didn't end, end, end your humanity and he still let things affect your flesh, he'll never get to you to what he raised you to. You'd be battling over here. All. You can't effectively move in over here on the side of the cross to resurrection until you effectively understand he ended your flesh and humanity. So none of these <clears throat> things move you. Because if they do, you'll never do his will because Satan will always get somebody over here to keep you back. And it's worked because we are fleshly people who keep identifying with our flesh, not our spirit. That make sense? Yeah. You remember the illustration I used about the onion? That when we go to counselors, they want to, okay, well, how did your mom treat you? That's layer number one. How did your dad treat you? That's layer number two. Did they do anything sexual to you? That's layer number three. And um, how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Oh, you grew up in the ghetto? That's layer number four. And they just keep... As if they're going to find the answer somewhere in your life. Like, boom, there it is. And that's why you're like this. He ended the onion. Get, a, get away from that. He ended the onion. You know, I, and I talk to people. Well, my family, my family abused me when I was 12. Oh, my God. You don't understand what he did. I'm not trying to be insensitive, but you, what, what, what do you think he went to the cross to end everything somebody did to you? And if you understood that, it wouldn't even c compute to you anymore what somebody did you at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Do you see how it's important to understand your death? Yeah. Well, I was raised on the wrong side of the tracks. Okay, you're dead. That, that, that's a flesh problem, and he ended that. Now you're raised in newness of life on his side of the tracks. Move on. It is the enemy's goal is to keep you camping out at things he ended. Because that makes you ineffective to move on to what he's called and raised you to. And of course, you're not identifying with the cross at that point. Cross, cross is meaningless to you if you can't die, not die. Have him say it right. 
if you can't take what he did and apply it to your life and become the I am of that situation. I am not a victim anymore. He ended victimization. You can't make a victim out of me. I wish a lot of the world out there would quit being victims. Huh? Do you not watch the media? Everybody's a victim. And when Christians start being victims, my God, where, where are we going? We follow suit. I'm not a victim. He ended victimization. Whatever you did to me, done. Over. Move on. I'm dead to it. I will not let you move me in any way, shape, or form. I'm dead to what you're saying about me. I'm dead to what you did to me. I'm dead to what you plan to do to me. Because my life is his life now. And you can't touch that life. All you can do is, all you can do is hit this. But it's, it's dead. So I don't respond. How about in your car? Have you ever got mad at somebody and honked or flipped them the bird or whatever? And then they did it back and you both pulled over. And now you're like, I'm in this thing. It's, 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 it's on. And had you just, just went on, had you just died to him or her, you could have moved on. I, I, don't have to respond to, I don't have to respond to idiots. I, I do not have to respond to your flesh in any way, shape, or form. Why would I want to respond to your flesh? It's dead. Here's where husbands and wives got to get this. I, you, he, he, he said something, and every time he acts this way and says these things, I go berserk. No, sorry, you're dead. You can't let his flesh arouse your flesh. You both have to be dead to each other. One of the things, if I ever get to counsel with anybody, nobody wants, to, wants me to marry them anymore because it would be too difficult to counsel with them because I, they'd end up not wanting to get married after I got done with them. But one thing I'd say, before you say I do, say you're dead to each other. How about putting that in the, um, what do you call them? Vows. Huh? Before I say I do, I'm dead. Now I do. I'm dead to your flesh. You're dead to my flesh. Because if you're not dead in all relationships, that relationship will run you. And there's a lot of people out there who wants to run you. They love the... Whap. <laughs> Pastors do it to their congregation. You, you will become not very liked when you start embracing your death because you won't argue with them. They want to fight. They want to argue. They want to, they want to get you to come back and say something. You're like, whatever. That's how you feel. That's Sorry. No, I don't know why you feel that way, but that's okay. You're not going to respond to their flesh because if you do, that's your flesh responding to their flesh. And Yeah, but they're not saved. Uh-uh. It says, all have died. He took their flesh to the cross. I don't care whether they're saved or not. You still have to see them crucified. You still have to see them and deal with them on the level of crucifixion. That might be the very way you get to them, to them getting born again. Paul talks about that too with husbands and wives. An unsaved husband. So um, all that's in there. All this making sense? So let me ask you this question again. <coughs> How many now believe that there's something else God has to do in you or remove from you before He gets something to you? Nothing. We're complete in Him, made whole, capable to deal with every situation, every conflicts. I'm dead to conflicts. I'm. I'm. Here's here's what most Christians we're all troubleshooters. When a conflict comes. We get into this fix mode and we attack and try to fix it. Wait a minute. No, I, <clears throat> conflict comes right off the bat. You don't move me. I'm dead. Now, Lord, what are you saying? Is there anything here you're requiring me to do or say or what? I'm not responding to conflict because I'm responding to earth. I am only raised to respond to heaven. And what heaven tells me, that's what we'll do on earth. And then I become the, the change to that environment or conflict at that point. He may say, walk away. Yeah, I don't know what he's going to say. 
you understand? When we understand what we are dead to, there is so... Wait, wait till we get over here. You, you, don't want, you don't want to be alive to anything over here. When you realize what you have been raised to, you, you just... This is why... This is, the, this is the flesh, this is the spirit, this is why they wage war against each other. Your humanity is never going to go away. Do you understand curses? You're, you know, believers are not under a curse, right? Galatians 3.13 says that we're not under a curse. Yeah. But everybody out there you deal with that's unsaved has, is under a curse. Everybody you deal with is under a curse. And everybody you deal with is going to come at you in the flesh. So how many people do you contend with on a day-to-day -day basis <clears throat> under curse and dealing with you in their flesh? And you're going to tell me you don't have to know your death? And keep rehearsing your death? Renewing your mind with your death? You deal, 90% of the people you probably deal with are under a curse and full of sin. And coming at you full-fledged flesh. And do you know how to deal with them? Or do you let them lower you down to their level of flesh and then you're now you're, you're, you're walking on the flesh level with them. You're talking on the flesh level with them. You're not even the light and salt anymore. There's so much I could get into. I mean, there's a whole lot more, but... Let me just close with this because we're almost top of the hour here. Um, when, you, when you say things, and I wrote down some things here, how we talk to each other, we identify them in the flesh. Like saying to our kids or to our spouse or somebody, oh, you're stupid. What, do you, what, what are you identifying them as? Is the new man stupid? No, you're... You're putting them into the flesh. Or you're saying that um, a, a wife says to her husband, you're not loving. You're not, you're not romantic. You're not loving. You're not this. You're not that. And he hears that for 15 years. And any attempt he tries to make, he still gets that. What is this spouse saying to the other one? They're saying, you're not loving. 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 You don't love me no more. Do you... What do you, you're, you're identifying them in the flesh when the answer is their spirit man. How about not saying that and coming over here and start speaking to their spirit man life? You are the love of God. God's love is shed abroad in your heart, and I receive what love you're giving me. I'll tell you what, that, that man's eye, veils will fall off and realize maybe he's more of the lover than he ever thought he was, which he is if Christ is in him. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm not talking about positive confession. I'm simply saying you are identifying by saying you're sick, you are saying your flesh is sick. It's been crucified. That sickness has been crucified. So I'm going to speak what he did on the cross that I now am. By his stripes I was. Not going to be, Peter put in the past tense, was healed. We have to quit talking from the identity of flesh. I don't know how we're going to pay these bills. Oh, my God. See? What are we going to do? Oh, I don't know what's going to happen now. Uh, we're going to have to... All this negativity. That's all humanity. You are talking humanity. He ended humanity. He raised you to a new life, and that life is in the kingdom, and we're kingdom-minded and new man-minded. And we speak after that order. I can't do that. I can do all things. There's always Scripture... To verse the flesh um, confession. <clears throat> like, I can't do that. I can do all things. That's impossible. All things are possible. There's always a scripture identifying you by the crap that comes out of your mouth. So you have to say, am I going to speak after the flesh or am I going to speak after the new man? Because there's no power from the cross speaking flesh. I'm weak. I'm sick. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. I walked around one day, I had a black cloud over my, life, my day, and I'm like, what the heck? I didn't do, what? And I just walked around, man, I'm just, I'm just down. I just kept talking, I'm down, I'm down. And totally, this was not registering. And then it was the end of the day, a little bit too late, that I went, why didn't I just? So the next time that it happened, and I felt that dark cloud coming, I said, you know what? That's not who I am. I don't know what. I don't know the source. That's not the I, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't know what this is. 
And I ain't bowing to it. But I know one thing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy, I have joy unspeakable, full of glory. That's all Bible. That's all the Bible says that I am. Everything I just said to you. Right? Huh? So you got to speak who you are as a result of what he did. Not what your flesh is telling you. Or what the enemy or humanity is telling you. You have died. Amen? Amen. All right. Anybody have any questions? Uh, one. Yes. Uh, as you're praying, I would like for you to pray for North Carolina and South Carolina. And down that way, my daughter lives in North Carolina. Sure. Thank you. Does anybody have any um, comments or questions regarding this? I do, but I'll talk to you afterwards. Okay. When you were um, when you first started talking about First Corinthians one eighteen and how um, we, pro we proclaim the cross and. Um, Tell the result of what he did. Um, what came to my mind when you started saying um, you know, why don't we do that? Why why don't we understand to do this? And the word dormant came to my mind that um, when we don't do that, we stay dormant in where we are. We can't no, exactly. We can't get past no, you won't. that sin. We can't get past anything. Hey, turn to keep that thought. We'll go to Romans chapter four, and keep that. Keep and, man, I want to ask you to re reiterate that after I show you the scripture. Go to Romans chapter four. See the problem. A lot. Of, I think one of the big problems. There's a lot of problems, but one of the bigger problems is it's hard to say something you don't see. Yeah, that's right. true. It's hard to say it's sun shining outside if it's pouring the rain down. That's not what we're asking you to do. That's hyper faith. That's mental gymnastics. That's not. We have a right to speak what God's word says if the fact in front of you contradicts God's word. Does that make sense? Now watch what happens here. Um, this is God's say. I, I just don't. I have a problem speaking things I'm not experiencing. Okay. You'll never experience it until you speak it because you obviously don't believe it. And the power is in the proclamation. But watch this. Romans chapter 4. Um, where is it at where it says he calls those things that are not as though they were? Is that in Romans 4? Um, yeah, it's Romans 4, uh, 17, the latter half of Okay, as is written, this, okay, now remember, Abraham's wife, Sarah, is barren. No doctor, can, there's nothing medical that they can do. Okay, she's dead in her womb. He says, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and what? Calls those things which do not exist as though they do. So if God spoke something to you, and what you're looking at is different, you are the vehicle in that environment to bring change. Right. By speaking, what's if you, you, you know, Trump is not going to get an ambassador to another country who's mute. He has to articulate what our government says to an ambassador in another country. If he says do this, he's got to tell them you're doing this. Right? Or did you get hung up on Trump? Should I use Obama? <laughs> I don't know where you are at on that, but don't get, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying the Bible calls you an ambassador. You're his representative. If God wants to change something and you are in that environment, you are the vehicle of change. You're the breakthrough in that environment. But you have to speak what you're hearing him in spite of what you're seeing. You've got to call those things that are not. Is, now, if you do that and you didn't hear God, it ain't going to work for you. You have to hear him or hear what he's speaking to you through the word. You've got to have an experience here before it manifests here. You can't go out of deadness. You have to hear heaven. Oh, you have good. to see heaven. 
You have to touch heaven. Heaven touches you. You hear. That's why it says today if you hear his voice. Then you, then you guarantee what you're speaking will come to pass. I heard him say it. And even it says here, he's not a man that he should lie. If he's spoken, he'll perform it. It's all here in Romans 4. But here's the kicker, and that might be what she's talking about, is that his name was Abram. Okay? I can't remember. What, what did that mean? Abram. I can't remember. My mind's blank. Okay? But God, as they were getting closer to Isaac being born, God's like, he's not calling those things or not as though they were. So I'm going to change his name. I'm going to change his name from Abram to Abraham. Now, Abraham means in the Hebrew, father of many nations. He doesn't have a kid. She's barren. And God says, I have to have somebody down there speaking my will. <coughs> Y'all ain't speaking it. You're acting like I never said it. You're producing Ishmael's. You're giving her away to other men. I'm, you know, come on. I need something. You're my representative. I need you to speak this. And so, I'll, I'll, I'll get him to speak it. I'll change his name to mean the promise I'm giving him. So that means his wife had to look at him every day and say, Father of many nations. Come here, Father of many nations. And then when he'd walk into town, what's your name? Abraham. Oh, where's all these kids? You? Because I know that means Father of many nations. I don't have any kids. That's embarrassing. To call yourself something that you're not. You will be ridiculed. You'll be made fun of. Father of many nations. His wife is barren. Now can you imagine his family and friends? You change your name to what? Why don't you wait till you have those nations before you call yourself that? But that's not what God does. God calls those things that are not, that do not exist, as if they do. And once you, that's why you've got to say, I am this. And your spouse says, no, you're, no, that's my flesh. I am this. There's the power. There's the power. Now, she says that we don't do that. That lays dormant. What do you think was laying dormant in Abraham and Sarah for 25 years? It wasn't long after till he, he got the baby after the name change. So she's right. If you don't, then that, that life in you that's waiting to be unveiled and lived through you, manifested through you, stays there, <coughs> dormant. Good, good comment, because I, I never thought about the Romans 4. So call yourself what the Bible calls you. I am what God says I am. Call those things that are not as though they were. I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm this, I'm that. There's so much more. My gosh, my mind's going 90 miles an hour. We'll, we'll end it. I mean, you can take this on every area of life and get victory. Yeah. Let me get, can I give you one more? Yeah. A lot of people are limited because maybe they're limited because they think because, of, because they're a woman. They feel limited. Um, a lot of people feel limited because of the color of their skin. A lot of people feel limited because they're divorced or limited because they don't have a big bank account, limited because they don't have an education, and they begin to start looking at themselves and they, they're creating an identity from their humanity. Well, do you understand when he ended that, you were no longer hindered by your IQ over on this end? He ended that. What God has raised you to has nothing to do with your IQ. What he's raised you to doesn't matter what your bank account is. What he's raised you to doesn't matter what your color of skin is or what gender you are. None of these things matter. These, everything about you that you have an inferiority complex or a self-consciousness with or what have you, he ended. Women, I'll tell you what he ended. You look in the mirror and you don't like what you see. Where did that come from? Because you're looking at Cosmopolitan magazines. I don't even know what you guys read. Is that, is that magazine still out? Anyway, you're looking at all these beautiful models and then you look at yourself. I look at these guys on GQ. Come on, man. Really? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm never going to be there even close to that. But I'm not inferior to those guys. I can stand beside a real good looking guy. Who cares? Now, there's a lot of people who be like, hide behind the chalkboard. I don't want to be by him. You understand? He makes me look like junk, you know? But you should be so secure in who you are in God that if a model, if you're a woman and a model walks up, you don't feel anything. You can even say, wow, you're beautiful, and not be jealous. I'm telling you, this is so hard. We can go on and on and on and on with this stuff. You can start praising when you see people get blessed, not be envy and jealous. I'm dead to envy and jealousy. That's the flesh. And I, I'm telling you, it is a, it is liberating. Do you really like to be envious? Do you, do you, you like walking around hating? Hating on people? Do you like how you feel when someone better than you shows up? If someone's a better teacher and a better speaker than me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit down and listen to them. Because that's a gift for me that makes me better. I'm not going to feel jealous if someone can speak better and teach better. I will sit under that person then and, and hear what they have to say. Because I'm dead to pride. I understand those things are hindrances to me. They're not helps. Everything the flesh offers me kills me. So I have to crucify, or I have to identify myself with my death. Galatians 5, 24, 26. The flesh has been crucified with its passions and desires. It's dead. It's dead. You know, the thought that came to me today is the loneliest person in the world. And there's a lot of lonely people out there. But think, if we could find the loneliest person in the world... He is not digging up a corpse in a graveyard to have a friend. Why? They're dead. Why are we dealing with things that are dead? I don't need to deal with that. It's dead. I don't need that part of that thing in my life. It's my flesh. It's dead. I don't need that. I don't want that. I'm done with that. And when you start seeing that these things have been declared to bow, start saying, wait, wait, wait. Why am I bowing to this jealousy? Every time, every time I am a debtor to my flesh, I'm bowing to it. I'm bowing to fear. I'm bowing to judgments. I'm bowing to condemnation. I'm bowing to judgmentalism. I'm bowing to what someone said I did two, 20 years ago. I ain't bowing to none of that. Why? I'm dead. You can't, you can't arouse a dead man in any way, shape, or form. Go to a funeral home and try to make that guy dead. That guy dead, make him mad. Pinch him. <laughs> Flip his nose. Till he, so he, will you stop it? I'm trying to die here. He's not going to respond. What don't we understand about death? We have to have our eyes open. He really did put an end to us. And it's the lies of the enemy that makes you think... You're a debtor to it. That has power, control, a voice. Oh, wait till we get to voices. Jeez. Everything, do you realize everything speaks to you? Yeah. Bills speak to you. Sickness speaks to you. Everything has a voice to intimidate you, to bow. You've got to silence the voices, the lies. All right, I can go on forever with this stuff. Totally liberating. Uh, do you want to be free? This is the way to go. And this is how come you're free, by the way. For it was for freedom that Christ set us free, Galatians 5.1. Okay, any, any other questions, comments? Let's pray for the, her family in North Carolina. Father, we come to you and we ask you to put a hedge of protection around Monica's family and keep them safe and everybody else for that matter. And, Lord, we just pray that that hurricane is not as bad as Actually, it is getting lesser, but still, it's, it's, it's crucial that um, people still get out. But, Lord, we ask that you just calm that storm. <clears throat> we ask for safety and protection for those people that are going to be able to not be able to get out and have to endure that. So we trust that you put that hedge of protection and save lives. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen.